From Green Goblin to Venom, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man universe plays host to some of the most iconic members of Spider-Man's rogues gallery. However, the universe of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man is far more layered than it may seem just by watching the films. So join me as we go beyond the Raimi-verse to discover various adversaries that Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man would go on to face, just not on the big screen. This is Beyond the Raimi-verse. So last episode, we looked at Matt Gargan, aka The Scorpion, quite a major player in Spider-Man 3 The Game. However, this story for Scorpion was only present in one particular version of Spider-Man 3 The Game, that being the Treyarch version, which released on Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. This story was not included in the Vicarious Visions version of the game, which was available for PlayStation 2, Nintendo Wii, and PSP. However, the Vicarious Visions version did get its own couple of villains in the place of Scorpion and a few other players that didn't make it over to this version. Yep, you know it's that time. In this episode, we are talking about the star of the greatest practical joke ever played against a multi-billion dollar film company, Enter Morbius. Now guys, as per usual, if you are enjoying this video so far, hit subscribe, and if you've already done that, well, hit the like button, but if you really want to take it to the next level, then I am starting a cult over on Patreon, which you can join by making a monthly pledge. Your support is what makes these ventures possible. Dr. Michael Morbius made his very first appearance in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 101 in 1971. Created by Roy Thomas and Gil Kane, Morbius was the response to the lifting of the ban on vampires in comics by the Comics Code Authority. Now I'm sure you all know Morbius' story as everybody in the world went to see that Morbius movie in theatres at least twice. But for the minuscule percentage of you that haven't, Dr. Michael Morbius had a rare and fatal blood disease. And while trying to find a cure for that blood disease, he transformed himself into Morbius, the living vampire. A vampire birthed from science rather than the super natural. When it came to his appearance in the Rainyverse though, Morby didn't come alone. Enter Shriek, who many of you will know as the secondary villain in Venom Let There Be Carnage. Seems that the Sonyverse is pulling a lot of cues from Spider-Man 3 the game in terms of its villain rosters, huh? Shriek made her first appearance in Spider-Man Unlimited number 1 in 1993, created by Tom DeFalco and Ron Lim. In her first appearance, she was referred to as Sandra Deal, but that name was quickly changed to Francis Louise Barrison, with Sandra Deal being retconned as an alias. Due to an abusive upbringing from her parents, Francis did not grow up to be the most stable individual, and it was exposure to Cloak's Dark Force dimension that transformed her into Shriek upon awakening her mutant abilities. Those abilities include flight, sonic manipulation, being able to control sound and shoot sonic beams everywhere, and a form of mind control which just brings out the worst in people. Right, so, enter Spider-Man 3 The Game, the Vicarious Visions version. So the Daily Globe is reporting that there's a vampire around in New York, and Jameson sends Peter to go get pictures. He tracks the vampire down to Columbia University, and the two have their first confrontation. It's a very swift one as Morbius quickly attacks and then leaves, but Peter's able to get his picture. And his doubts regarding there being a vampire in New York City appear to be quashed for now. With the trail temporarily going cold, Spider-Man returns to Dr. Connor's lab to conduct more tests on the symbiote, as the two are researching it together. And we get this moment of tremendous voice acting here. All those tests and nothing! Tobey Maguire, bless you, man. <laughs> Honestly though, I thought this was a really good depiction of symbiote-infused Spider-Man. Him just really letting out his impatience before venting it out to MJ down the phone. This was a really smart portrayal of the character, and one that I think was probably more in line with what people wanted from Black Suit Spider-Man than what we got in Spider-Man 3 the movie. And when Peter hears the distant shrieks of someone being attacked by a vampire, well, he gives chase and we get this tremendous line. Kick me off on the wrong night, cat. No, okay, just kidding. He didn't really say that. Just He says it again. I, I won't censor it this time. Kick me off on the wrong night, Count. A line so iconic that Spidey says it twice, and uh, it's no less witty the second time. Is it me, or do the cutscenes on the PS2 version of Spider-Man 3, the game, look somehow better than the ones 
on the Xbox 360 and PS3 version. Make no mistake, this game doesn't look good visually, but there's something nice and textured about these cutscenes. Anyway, Morbius and Spider-Man fight on the rooftops of Columbia University, and Spider-Man wins the fight by exposing him to the sunlight, basically fighting him until dawn. Man, Spidey, no wonder you're so cranky. Your sleep pattern's all out of whack. I know a thing or two about that. Either this guy's a real vampire, or the best method actor I've ever seen. In his weakened state, Michael Morbius is taken to Dr. Connors for research, which is where Connors reveals to Spider-Man that he knows Michael Morbius. There's a nice dichotomy between Spider-Man, Connors, and Morbius here. Morbius explains how by night he becomes this vampire, and it's just this, this darkness that overcomes him. A Jekyll and Hyde kind of deal. Earlier in this game, Connors became the lizard, who we'll talk about in a later episode, yay! And Peter with the symbiote affecting his behaviors. So these two are very understanding of Morbius' condition. These are three good men that have been overcome by something that's happened to them, and I, I just think that's really cool. However, here's where we get our first major departure. There's no mention of any kind of blood condition for Michael Morbius, and he was transformed into a living vampire by his wife, Francis. Wait a minute, his wife Francis, as in Francis Louise Barrison? And here we get another major departure. As far as my understanding and research goes, Shriek was never affiliated with Morbius in the comic books, let alone married to him. In fact, Shriek was Carnage's love interest. Imagine cucking Carnage. Obviously, Carnage isn't in Spider-Man 3 the game, which would be cool because you got Venom and you could have Carnage, but nah, there's surprisingly not a huge deal done with Venom and Carnage's rivalry in the video games. In fact, all multimedia, really. That's crazy. Yeah, we got Venom, let there be Carnage, but like, uh, spoiler alert, he was kind of killed off. What's potential? Can I spend it? Francis is also in a transformed state, becoming Shriek. I mean, she's married though, you know, and, and Dr. Michael Morbius isn't a bad guy, and she's the one that turned him into the living vampire. Oh, women, am I right? So, I mean, one would assume that she's quite a, you know, perfectly high-functioning person, not the unhinged character from the comics. So, Spider-Man chases down Shriek, and her abilities are much like in the comics. She can control sonic waves, making sonic shields around her, shooting beams out, and she can control people's minds, making them into her children, as she refers to them. However, here's where the difference comes in. Barrison's abilities are not dormant mutant abilities awakened by the Dark Dimension. They are instead granted to her by the Symbiote, the same Symbiote that landed in Central Park and infected Peter. This is kind of interesting. It almost feels like, kind of like the concept anyway, is almost kind of like Silk before Silk, in that like it's the thing that happened to Peter by complete chance, also happened to somebody else. I mean, yeah, that does open up questions. Like, did the symbiote affect other people in the city? However, Shriek's abilities being entirely based around Sonic's doesn't actually make any sense whatsoever. In fact, Shriek's powers in this open up all kinds of questions and implications. Yes, she's infected by the symbiote, but why does that allow her to fly? We don't see Venom flying or Spider-Man flying or, or Venom flying. Worse yet though, Sonics are a symbiote's greatest weakness alongside heat. Nobody tell Venom what my favorite video game is. So why would a symbiote be able to produce Sonics? And does that make the symbiote immune to the Sonics? And how exactly did she turn Morbius into a vampire? I mean, like, why also? We know she can control people's minds. <laughs> this is something that has in common with the Scorpion story, mind control, hack. Huh? But why turn Morbius into a fully fledged vampire when she could just turn him into one of her children? I mean, okay, the, the implications there are a bit weird, but like you've built in a new weakness for the guy. You're gonna, you're gonna kill your own husband. You're really rude. But like her children don't seem to have an aversion to sunlight, so it, it's very strange. She's also able to build obelisks, which are kind of a source of some of her power anyway, so that's certainly a video game mechanic right there. And she does this weird whispery thing, and listen, I, as someone who hates, who hates ASMR whispering, this ugh, really dusts my doilies. She does it a lot. I don't, look, I don't hate ASMR, we're just like brushing and stuff. Like, I, I like that, but whispering, uh, it gives me the wiggles. So, after destroying Shriek's obelisk, Shriek gets away and Spider-Man realizes the futility of trying to get Shriek to come to Morbius and help him. And so he decides to take Morbius to Shriek's hideout, where we learn a little more of Morbius' origins. So he was researching blood pathogens. It's never said why, but basically she released those and that's what transformed him into Morbius. Right. 
Gotcha. <laughs> Man, the, the blanks really just fill in themselves here, huh? She strengthens Morbius up again, and we get a two-on-one fight between Spider-Man, Morbius, and Shriek. So Morbius is once again defeated by sunlight, and Shriek uses her sonic abilities to manipulate Peter, springing her children onto him, but as far as he's concerned, they take on the images of people like Mary Jane, J. Jonah Jameson, Harry Osborn, Dr. Connors, and he has to just fight his way through them. Yeah, it's kind of funny seeing Peter punching MJ. Am I, am I a terrible person for saying that? Dude, she cheated on him. This isn't even the real MJ anyway, so that, that just makes it okay, right? She, she wasn't good to him. That doesn't mean you should, but it's just kind of, you know... I, I don't know, I, I got a lot to explain here, haven't I? YouTuber apology coming soon. However, it's switching between the dark and the red suit that allows Peter to see the children. Uh, as in uh, Shriek's children, they're not actual children. If Peter was beating up children, that would be really funny. Ah, oh, I really can't stop myself, can I? Oh yeah, here's a bit of game trivia. Remember how Spider-Man Web of Shadows, a big part of its promo was, for the first time ever, you can switch between the black and red suit in gameplay. And this was because in Spider-Man 3, the game, you couldn't actually just switch them? Well, in the Vicarious Visions version, not only could you, you kind of had to. As if Peter kept the black suit on too long, he'd go into a rolling blackout. And this boss fight would work that mechanic into it. Upon her defeat, for some reason Shriek seems to have something of a change of heart and transforms Morbius back into... Well, Morbius, but he's not a vampire. So Spider-Man does what he always does and just dumps her on Dr. Connors' doorstep. And we don't hear from her again. So, that's the story of Morbius and Shriek in the Raimiverse. This storyline is absolutely full of holes. Considering Morbius is a vampire born out of science and not supernatural stuff, it sure relies on a lot of, ooh, space magic, which Peter for some reason can't do. There are a lot of implications here, and these two characters are certainly a far cry from their comic book counterparts. There are glimmers of smart storytelling in here though, such as the dichotomy between Peter, Connors, and Morbius, and exploring the possibility of the symbiote affecting other people in New York City. Smart, it's just it doesn't really work for Shriek. It was cool though that the Vicarious Visions version of this game did get two of its own exclusive villains to make up for the lack of Scorpion, Rhino, and Kingpin. Now, given that this game wasn't considered to be the core version of Spider-Man 3, the game, like, the quintessential version is generally the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 version, you wouldn't go seeing any action figures of Spider-Man 3, Morbius, and Shriek. Which I guess is kind of a shame, as their designs are pretty interesting. And look, we all know, we all know that Morbius merch would just fly off of the shelves. I got nothing. This episode was filler. I hope you enjoyed it. For those wondering if I've seen the Morbius movie, I haven't seen it. <laughs> not even part of me has felt compelled to go see it. I'm just not interested. Who do you think I'll cover next? I'd be excited to see your predictions in the comments below. So, Toby Maguire, play me out. Looks like you're done now. Go outside and play. So what do you guys think? If you enjoyed this video and you want to support more like it, be sure to hit that big, beautiful subscribe button. And of course, in the description below are links to different social media feeds, including the Patreon. If you're feeling extra generous, like the following people. Who are Marcus Ward, Sirius the Skeptic, Biotin Arts, Mr. SP, David 20 Covers, Sergio, Shodin, Legendary Ray Ray, Adam Myers, thank you guys, you are the best of the best, but as for the rest of you, thank you so much for watching guys, and have a great day.